Of all the freedoms we exercise as Americans, none is more fundamental than the right to vote, to cast a ballot, to go to the polls, participate in our own governance. So when the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act last July, it was a blow to all those who had fought and bled for its enactment, all those who had suffered and marched and risked their lives, all those who had been beaten and bludgeoned and seen their friends die. For them, the Voting Rights Act was the supreme vindication of their sacrifice because more than the Emancipation Proclamation, more than any of those amendments at the end of the Civil War, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 actually conferred the basic rights of citizenship on those of African descent who had endured three centuries of slavery and a hundred years of Jim Crow and who could finally exercise the most basic guarantee of a democracy, the right to be counted. Of course, other landmarks of the civil rights era had already crumbled to dust. Six years prior, the court virtually overturned Brown v. Board of Education, literally turning it on its head, declaring it constitutionally impermissible for schools to strive for racial integration. The results were predictable. Just this past summer, researchers at the University of North Carolina School of Education here in Chapel Hill concluded that nationwide, quote, students are more racially segregated in their schools today than they were in the late 1960s. And the court has been chipping away at affirmative action for years. But the demise of the Voting Rights Act seemed like the ultimate defeat, as though the very legal pillars of equality had fallen, like the hands of the clock had turned back half a century, like the gains of the civil rights movement had all fizzled, and the spark that ignited the flame of idealism had turned to ashes. That's why Congressman John Lewis of Georgia said that he wanted to cry when the act went down. It signaled the end to a, a lifetime of hard-won progress. As a young man, he started out as a freedom writer, like those who'd passed through Chapel Hill 14 years before, whom Reverend Charlie Jones had sheltered on his floor after their lives were threatened by the Klan. Lewis was among the second wave of those writers living out their Christian faith through nonviolent witness. He started out training for the ministry, but decided that his real calling was confronting bigotry and hate head on. So in the basement of a church, he helped to found the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee dedicated to changing society through purely peaceful means. Lewis was on the podium with Dr. King in 1963. He went on to organize the voter drives that became Mississippi Freedom Summer. And the following year, he spearheaded the march from Selma to Montgomery, where unarmed protesters were attacked by rioting Alabama state troopers wielding truncheons wrapped in barbed wire police who fractured his skull and gave him scars he still bears. Scenes from that bloody Sunday shocked the country. And when Martin issued a plea for clergy to come to Selma to protect the marchers, hundreds from every faith responded, but none more than the Unitarian Universalists. The Reverend James Reeb, a 38-year-old minister from Washington, D.C., was among those who turned out in solidarity and who died when his head was 
bashed from behind with a baseball bat as he was walking on the sidewalk after dinner, his crime dining at an integrated restaurant. Reeb's killers were never brought to justice, but his martyrdom roused the nation for four days after the murder. Lyndon Johnson sent to Congress legislation that required the states of Old Dixie, along with other jurisdictions that had a history of discrimination at the polls, to clear their electoral regulations with the U.S. Department of Justice for the first time ever in many places from the mole hills of Mississippi to the stone mountain of Georgia, blacks could vote. And the political landscape was transformed as black mayors and city councilors, state legislators took office, even congressmen like John Lewis in a remarkable journey from being kicked and knocked unconscious and hit over the head with a wooden crate as a civil rights protester to serving 13 terms in the U.S. House of Representatives. For Congressman Lewis, last summer's Supreme Court ruling was a decision that he said broke his heart. I felt like saying, come, come walk in the shoes of the people who tried to register, who tried to vote, but did not live to see the passage of the Voting Rights Act. This is a plea to which the High Court seems deaf. With little understanding of this tortured past, Judge Antonin Scalia called the Voting Rights Act a perpetuation of racial entitlement. Chief Justice John Roberts asserted simplistically that the way to stop racial discrimination is to stop discriminating by race as though the pretense of being colorblind could make it all go away. But regardless of the legal reasoning, the practical effects were plain. For within hours of this decision, tough new laws aimed at reducing minority turnout were introduced in Texas. Similar laws quickly followed in Mississippi and Alabama, and South Carolina and Virginia, northern and western states like Wisconsin and Arizona, as well as closer to home. Here in North Carolina, neither student IDs nor public employee IDs nor IDs issued by public service agencies will be acceptable to gain entrance to the voting booth come the election after this one, affecting an estimated 319,000 Tar Heels who don't have the proper credentials. No backups or affidavits are allowed if your paperwork's out of order. Poll observers or self-appointed vigilantes can challenge voters with or without any probable cause. The period for early voting is shortened. Sunday voting eliminated precincts prevented from extending their hours if long lines form, paid voter registration drives are barred, and the mandate to do high school drives to bring in more younger voters has been repealed. All of these restrictions purportedly having the purpose of reducing voter fraud, a problem which does not exist. But these laws have the transparent effect of swinging elections away from minority candidates and those who support them. Just one of these provisions, eliminating same-day registration for early voting, would have reduced turnout by over 4,000 in Durham County alone, according to one estimate. 4,000. This in a state that Barack Obama won by just 14,000 votes back in 2008. The question is, what should we do about it? Or do these matters concern us as a church at all? I have heard it said, for example, and heard it said here, that politics don't belong in the pulpit. And I've heard it said that people come to church to find serenity on Sunday morning not to be stressed by controversies that better belong on the editorial page or on the nightly news. 
But of course, that was never the attitude of Reverend Charles Jones, who lived through even more challenging times. The same year that John Lewis and Martin Luther King Jr. organized their march on Washington. Some of you remember, because some of you were here. There were others marching in Chapel Hill, picketing establishments like the Tar Heel Sandwich Shop and Clarence's Grill and the Colonial Drug Store, businesses that refused to serve African American patrons. A photo from the UNC newspaper, the Daily Tar Heel, shows Reverend Jones, too, marching, carrying a picket sign, while an op-ed column from the Chapel Hill News almost exactly 50 years ago, from the 12th of January in 1964, carried the full text of his sermon where he commented on the massive civil disobedience taking place on Franklin Street. He said, within a month's time, 239 anti-segregation protesters have been arrested and charged with trespass and other laws. It's a sad, serious situation, but what can we do about it? Some are already doing something in a grocery store which has a sign on the door reading whites only. Protesters have had Clorox and ammonia poured on their bodies and sprinkled in their eyes, some requiring medical treatment before they could go to jail. At a restaurant on Pittsburgh Row, the management didn't bother to call the police to protect their rights, but instead poured water and began kicking and using other tactics to meet the demonstrators with violence. Individuals have a tendency, in Chapel Hill as elsewhere, to sit out these troublous periods, Jones observed. We have our desires and hopes, but we leave it to officials and organizations to deal with them. But leaving politics to the politicos was not his way. Jones spoke forcefully from the pulpit on segregation, on uneven justice in the courts, on labor issues, on our broken health care system, on war and peace. And he recognized that people have differing opinions. We have differing viewpoints. Conscience does not speak with a single voice. It speaks within the entire church as a community of moral discourse but it is the church's role to be a conscience, to be a compass, to be a beacon to the larger society. As he said in the service of dedication for this church building, this house will become a home when there is controversy within it. One thing we cannot do, in my view, is to be neutral it's impossible to be apolitical, to be non-controversial, to take no interest in the laws that govern our state or in economic policy or foreign affairs, is simply to endorse the status quo, to acquiesce in business as usual, to abdicate our ethical agency, to abandon the prophetic dimension of our faith, because not taking a stand is also a position. Not taking sides is a way of taking sides. Silence means assent. And the only question is, what side are you on? That's why Unitarian Universalist ministers across North Carolina have issued an appeal for all of those around the country who share our values to come to Raleigh next month in alliance with the NAACP to call for a restoration of voting rights in our state. That's why the Reverend Peter Morales, the president of the UUA, will be there joining Reverend Barber. In the words of your former minister, my Brit, and eight other clergy who were arrested last spring in the Moral Monday protests, we knew that to suppress the vote is to suppress the spirit of a person. We knew that any attempt to erode our democracy is rooted in a desperate history 
of paralyzing and painful politics that would serve none of us. We knew that our own history and the sacrifices of those who came before called us to this struggle. This gathering in Raleigh will be the largest civil rights action since Selma. Its aim is to pick up and rekindle a torch that has almost been extinguished, to revive a dream that's almost been forgotten, to recreate a movement that for one brief shining moment seemed to unite Americans across lines of race and creed and class in the pursuit of a common vision, a vision of a beloved community where the richest country in the world could share its abundance, where no child would go hungry or be denied a decent education because of accidents of birth, where the dignity of labor would merit a dignified wage, where a peacetime economy might supply necessities for the many rather than luxuries for the few, where public investments in preschools and jobs and renewable energy might be considered just as important as building more prisons or weapons or cutting taxes for billionaires, where no one would feel ashamed because of their color or their culture, and no one would be encouraged to feel proud or privileged because of unearned wealth. This is the dream. This is the vista that Martin saw from the mountaintop. This is the around the bend, still to be realized future that the universe's long moral arc is reaching toward. And don't believe that any of it is easy to achieve. But don't think either that this is an impossible dream. Otherwise, why go to such lengths to restrict the vote, to silence the voices of ordinary citizens, to intimidate the people and rein in their rights? What other reason but for the fact that we do have the power to change things? Make no mistake. They are afraid of you. They are afraid of college students, and hardworking families, and lesbians, and gays, women, seniors, liberals, moderates, environmentalists, the unemployed, the squeezed middle class, single moms, Latinos, blacks, burger flippers, college professors, people with disabilities, people without good health care. They are afraid of majority rule, they are afraid democracy might work. 